start recording. Let's see, we should now be now be recording. We are recording, okay. Um, just in case there are any connectivity issues, if you did get disconnected during the lecture, then you'll be able to go back and, and watch it. Um, okay, so we're going to be going through the uh, the rest of the study guide today, hopefully the rest of the study guide, as much of the study guide as we can get through. Um, last class, we uh, finished problem seven. So that's where we were at. Um, I also ask you guys uh, to hopefully go through the exam if you had uh, the study guide, um, if you had time, and to possibly let me know any questions you wanted to go through at the beginning, uh, just in case we don't have time to go through the entire thing, uh, so that we can for sure at least hit uh, those questions that you want to see for sure. So um, if you have any questions that you want to see, uh, let me know. And we'll start with those. And then after those, we'll uh, jump back to where we ended, which was at 8. Um, if you don't have any questions you want to see, then we'll just start start at question eight. Um, but and I'll, I'll give you guys a, a couple of, a little bit. Let's see, I see question 11. Let's do that one. Uh, because I know there is a little bit of, of delay. Uh, so I'll give you guys a, little, uh, a moment or two to type in any, any questions that you want to see. For sure. I see question 11, question 17. Okay. So we'll start with question 11 then. I see question 12. Okay, I'll add that to the list. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll we'll get started on question 11. Um, if you if you guys do have any questions you want to see, just go ahead and uh, throw those in chat, and I'll add those to the list. Um, but otherwise, again. Uh, if there are no other other recommended questions, we'll just jump back to where we ended last class, which is that question eight. Okay, so let me see here, looking at question 11. So question 11 is this one on, on loan payments, right, okay. Um, I was actually looking through this one, and there were some things that I wanted to edit in this question uh, that ended up being in this question anyways. But let's let's uh, read through it. I'll, I'll let you know what parts are important, what parts you can ignore, and then we'll go through the, uh, the solution. So you decide to buy a house for $130,000. That's going to be our loan amount. Okay, and I see a question 19, so I'll add that to the list as well. So our loan amount is 130,000. Uh, you find a bank that will provide you a loan of 15 years. So the term, uh, the loan term is 15 years with an APR of 7.5%. 7, 7 uh, this part, the uh, down payment of 30% in one point that I had meant to uh, remove so that you can ignore. Uh, what is the monthly payment? So that is the first thing that we want to determine. What is the monthly payment? Uh, so we'll use our payment formula to find that. Um, what are the total monthly? Well, that should say what is the total amount paid? Uh, what percentage of the total amount paid is in interest? And then the rest of this, the uh, closing costs and, and the rest of this, that was uh, what the uh, project for theme two was for, so I'm not going to test on that. Um, so you don't need the down payment and the one point 
and you don't need to worry about the uh, closing cost or this um, twenty four thousand dollars a year that was that was uh, supposed to be covered in the project project two. Okay, so let's go to our digital paper here and start. So this one is question eleven. Whoop. Okay, question 11. So we have the uh, loan amount is 150,000, uh, no, 130,000. We have the APR is 7.5%. Now remember, when we are dealing with uh, these equations that have percentages, we're going to want to convert them into decimal form. So the decimal form for this is 0 0.075. Okay, uh, the loan term is 15 years. We have 15 years to pay this off and we want to make monthly payments. Okay, so that's the pertinent information. And uh, what we are looking for is, well, looking for what are the monthly payments, first off. Uh, second, uh, what is the total amount paid? And lastly, uh, how much or what percent, sorry, what percent of the total amount is interest? Okay, so those are the questions that we want to answer. Uh, let's go back to our study guide. Um, so here's the study guide for theme two. If you recall, uh, these equations were, pro were provided. That is going to be the same for the final exam. I'm not going to, let me, let me uh, phrase this in, in the exact way. I'm not going to require you to memorize anything for the final that you didn't have to memorize for the previous in-class exam. So any of the things that were provided for the previous exams will be provided for the final. So this, this box will appear on the final exam. Um, again, it's going to be just uh, as before with these these uh, equations, you're not going to be told what the equations are or what the variables mean, but they will be provided as you see here. So if you recall, this third equation is our payment formula. So that is the formula we're going to be using. All right, so let's go back to our digital paper. So first let's write down the equation uh, so that we have it on our paper ready to go. So we have the payment is equal to principal times the APR over N divided by, and we have one minus, we'll have one plus the APR over N to the negative N times Y power Okay, and for this then, we want to identify the variables. Uh, we'll plug those into the equation first, then we'll uh, look at how do we calculate that with our, use our calculator to find the value. So P is the principal amount, that was uh, the amount of our loan, 130,000. The APR was given to us. That is uh, 0 0.075. Again, we want that in decimal form. Uh, let's see, N is the number of payments we make per year. Since we're making monthly payments, N is 12. And let's see, what else do we need? Y, the term loan, Y, is 15 years. We have 15 years to pay the loan off. Okay, so we get that the monthly payment 
is going to be the principal. So we, we have 130,000 times our 0 0.075 divided by 12. And then this divided by 1 minus, we'll have parentheses, 1 plus the APR is 0 0.075 divided by 12 to the negative 12 times uh, 15 power. And that is what our expression looks like. So we want to plug this into the calculator, find what is our monthly payment. And from that, we can figure out the rest of the problem. Um, now, if you recall in class, we broke this down into a couple of steps. Our first step was to get these uh, parentheses here, this, this uh, first set of parentheses, the 1 plus 0 0.075 over 12. Uh, after that, we added the entire denominator. And then our third step was for the, the entire thing, was our third step. Uh, so maybe we should remind ourselves how we plug that into the calculator. And let me just write this down really quickly so that I can copy it on the next page. Okay. All right. So I'll get a fresh page here. So the first part, we would do uh, parentheses, one plus 0 0.075 divided by 12 parentheses. And then to the power, so we would either have the caret key or the y to the x key, or sometimes that's x to the y, depending on the brand of calculator. Uh, parentheses, negative 12 times 15, and parentheses. So that was the first part. Second part, to get the denominator, we would do 1 minus the answer. Uh, most. Well, maybe I don't want to say most. A lot of the non-programmable non calculators and even the programmable calculators, calculators should have an answer key. If it doesn't, then you'll have to store it in the as a memory function in the memory function and then recall it. Um, so just be aware of that. And then for uh, the third part, we would do the entire thing. So we do 130,000 times the 0 0.075 divided by 12 and divided by, again, the answer from the previous step. OK. Uh, for the sake of time, because I do want to try to get through the entire exam, I'm going to just give you what the solution should be. So what you should get for the monthly payment is $1,205. And the decimal is 0 0.1160 and so on, but we'll round to the nearest uh, second two decimal places because this is a money value. So it would be uh, 0.12. And that's uh, our monthly payment. All right. OK. Let's look back at the review, see what else we needed to find. Uh, what is the total amount paid? OK. So for the total amount paid, then we take the monthly payment, so we're paying $1,205.12 per month. So we multiply that by 12 to get how much we pay per year. 
and then multiply that by 15 since we are paying this loan over 15 years. So you plug that into our calculator, the 1,205.12 times 12 times 15, and what we should get is 200 and sixteen thousand uh, dollars nine hundred and twenty one and sixty cents so that is the total amount we have paid in those uh, 15 years okay and then the last question uh, from this is what is the percentage of that that is paid in interest what is the percentage of the total amount paid in interest so first we have to find the amount paid in interest. So the amount paid in interest is the total amount minus the principal amount that we borrowed. So the total amount we had was this $216,921.60 minus the principal amount. The uh, initial amount we borrowed was 130000 So we take the difference of those. We have the $216,921.60 minus the $130,000. Make sure that I have the right number of zeros. And we get uh, 86,000. Let's see, where is my math? There we go. 86,000. $921.60. So that is the amount that we've paid in interest, the uh, total amount we've paid in interest. So to get the percent of that, uh, we take the amount we paid in interest, which is this $86,921.60, divide that by the total amount we paid, $216,921.60, and we want, this is a percent, so to get it into percent form, we multiply by 100. And let's round to one decimal place. So this is uh, 40.07, so rounded to one decimal place is 40.1%. So 40.1% of the amount we have paid, of the total amount, went to interest. Okay. So that one was question 11. Uh, next was question 17. So let's go back to our review and see what we get for question 17. Ah, okay. Uh, so this was theoretical probabilities. This was back in uh, chapter seven. That was the first chapter we did um, in this course. And so what we're looking at is what is the theoretical probability of drawing a face card, which we are designating as a jack, queen, or king from a standard deck of cards. Okay, so theoretical probability. And we're going to assume that the deck is fairly shuffled and all of that to make sure that the probability is accurate. Okay, so 17, you wanna know what is the probability of drawing a face card? Well, that's funny place, a face card which we're saying is a jack, a queen, or a king from a standard deck, so from a 52 card deck. Okay, so the probability, uh, this is going to be out of 52 since there are 52 possibilities. Uh, now, um, 
for the Jack Queen or King, there's only one of those per suit, if you recall. And I am going to have uh, an image of the standard 52 card deck as well uh, for the final exam. You don't have to have that memorized if you don't already. Uh, so there are three of those cards per suit. And if you recall, on the standard deck, there are four suits. There's the, uh, the clubs, the spades, the diamonds, and the hearts. So there are four suits, three face cards in each suit. So that is 12 out of 52 is our probability. Um, for for the uh, for this one, you don't ne you won't necessarily have to uh, have to simplify that. For probabilities, I, I need to be careful about this. For probabilities, you do not have to simplify. Okay. For for other fractions, you do. Um, or what I might do for the exam is ask you to put it uh, as a percent. So let's uh, find the percent. If we do twelve divided by 52, and then times by 100, uh, then this is going to be, let's round to two decimal places, 23.08%. That, uh, that might be a better way since we're using Web Campus. Um, I'll probably ask you for it in, in percent form. Okay, so that was question 17. All right, uh, next, someone mentioned question 12. So let's go to a review, see what question 12 looks like. Aha, uh -huh. okay, uh, so 12, we're looking at correlation. So this one is all right. So we're, we're considering the scatter plot given below. We want, we want to identify the two variables being compared first, uh, discuss the potential correlation between these variables so um, that means is the cor is the correlation strong or weak, negative or positive? And here we're using the correlation coefficient, and we want to discuss whether you believe there is causality. No, nope, no, we're not going to worry about. It. We didn't do causality, so that that part should have been removed. Okay. So looking at this, uh, the first thing we want to do is identify the variables. So the variables come from um, the uh, x and the y axis. So on the uh, y axis here, we have average size in acres. So that is what we have for one of our variables is uh, size in acres. And the second one is number of farms. Uh, and that's given in, in uh, millions. So this three is three million, this two is two million, and so on. Okay, so the, the two variables being compared are the, uh, the size in acres and the number of farms in millions. Those are the two variables. Uh, next, we wanna know whether, let's, uh, let's start with negative or positive. Is the, is the correlation negative or positive? So we do see that we have, we have this correlation since the dots are not just randomly all over the place, they do look like they are forming a line, which is shown here with this with this line given. Uh, so there is a correlation. Is this positive or negative? Well, if you recall, um, when we read these going left to right, if the values are going up, then it's a positive correlation. If they're going down, it's a negative correlation. So in this particular example, the one that's given on the review, is this a positive or a negative correlation? Negative, yes, good, exactly right. This is a negative correlation, good. And we wanna know, is this a strong correlation or a weak correlation? So when we are given the correlation coefficient, that's this, this number right here, this R squared. Um, good, I see the answer already. Uh, if you can, think of, you can think of the correlation coefficient as 
this 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 might not be the 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 best way to think of it, but you can think of it as a percent. Um, so. Let me let me try and fix that. Is is the sound back? Fixed. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Um, okay. So you you can think of this as a percent. So if this number is if the percent is below fifty fifty percent, then we're going to say it's weak. If it's above fifty, then we're going to say it's strong. Uh, and so in this case, it's an 83%. So we're going to say this is a strong, strong correlation. Um, now, someone said, uh, good, yeah, th for that comment, this could be stronger, but for our purposes, uh, then, this is, then this is fine. That is correct. Because um, depending on, on your field of study, you might, uh, you might move where that is. But since we are just looking at strong and weak, and we're not looking at very strong, very weak, then we're just saying above 50, less than 50. So this is a strong correlation. OK, uh, so that one was number 12, I believe. That was all of the, let's uh, double check. So we identified the variable. We discussed whether it's strong or weak uh, and positive or negative. And the correlation coefficient, again, we're thinking of that as a percent. So if that's over 50, we think of that as strong. If it's under 50, we think of that as weak. And the causality we're not doing. OK, so that's question 12. And then I saw question 19. So let's go to question 19 next. OK, so question 19, we're looking at half-life and doubling time. Uh, so given the half-life or doubling time, find the quantity that is present. OK. Um, so for this one, I actually have to going to have to open the other study guide that we just had. Um, that is all right. Should have had that open before. I apologize. Um, let's see. Where did I save that? Here we are. And there and there. Okay. Um, so let's read it first. So right now your con your countertop has one E. coli cell, and uh, in the right environment, E. coli can double every 11 minutes. So our doubling time, we see that that keyword double. Uh, the doubling time is every 11 minutes. We want to know how many cells will be on your counter in three hours. And here they give us a hint: be careful of units. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys are are careful of that now. You should uh, hopefully be used to me saying, make sure the units match. Uh, so let me open up our study guide that we had from uh, test three. So this was the with the equation. So the doubling time is this this one right here. So we have the new value is the initial value times two to the power of t over the capital. T double. All right. So let's go to our paper. I need a fresh page here. So this one is 19. OK. And we have, um, we're using the initial amount, uh, not the initial amount. The amount is equal to the initial amount times 2 to the power of lowercase t over capital T double, since we're looking at doubling time. OK. All right. Uh, so let's get the information from our problem. Let's see, right now the countertop has one E. coli cell. So the initial amount is one cell. 
Uh, next, the doubling time, it can double every 11 minutes. So T subscript double is 11 minutes. We want to know how many cells will be on your counter in three hours. So lowercase t is three hours. Now here is where you have to be careful. These are both time uh, so that the units have to match in order for us to use this equation. Notice our doubling time is in minutes and the time we're concerned with is in hours. So we have to convert this um, either both to hours or both to minutes. Let's convert both to minutes. Since there are 60 minutes in an hour, we multiply the three times 60. And we get 180 minutes. Okay, so the amount is going to be equal to one times two to the power of lowercase t is 180 divided by our doubling time is 11 minutes. Uh, now, when you are typing this into the calculator, I'm just going to, um, uh, let's, let's go ahead and remind ourselves how we, how we would do that. You have to be careful because the initial amount, if it's not one, that's going to, uh, because this one is one, it's not going to affect it too much, but, but if it's not one, if it's greater than one, then it's going to be, uh, it can affect the answer. So we'll do one times, you should do parentheses, and then two, or if it's half-life, that would be one half, parentheses, and then the power button, so the caret, or the y to the x, depending on your brand of calculator, parentheses, you do need that parentheses there, 180 divided by 11 parentheses. Okay, uh, so we plug that into our non-programmable calculator, and let's see what we get. So we have one times parentheses two, parentheses to the power, parentheses, 180 divided by 11, parentheses, enter. And because these are cells, let's round to the nearest whole number. So we have 84,323 cells, E. coli cells, after just three hours. Okay. That one was question 19. And let me check the chat to make sure that I didn't miss any questions that were asked in the queue. After that, I don't see any after 19. So um, again, if you do have questions, then we can jump back to those. Otherwise, I'm going to, uh, we'll start back where we left off last class, which is at question eight. Okay, so let me go back to the right window here. We want the review. Here's the review. We want the final exam review. Okay, so eight. Define accuracy and precision. All right, so accuracy and precision. So number eight, accuracy, if you recall, is uh, how close a measurement is to the true value. So the closer the measurement is to the true value, the more accurate it is. The further away from the true value, the less accurate it is. And then precision is the amount of detail in a measurement. So more detail means it's more precise, less detail means it's less precise. And uh, what we meant by detail is uh, the, how did we phrase that? 
the smaller your possible measurement, the more detail you have, the more accurate, uh, the more precise it is, sorry, not accurate, precise. So um, the smaller possible measurement, is more precise. OK. Now, with this one, we also included a question. If you're given uh, two measurements and a true value, then you can uh, compare those. You can say which one is more accurate, which one is more precise. And we had an example in class. Um, now for these ones, let me let me get the the uh, correct page number for these in case you want to look these up. So this was um, this was in section three C. So we'll go to three C and you go to the exercises at the end. We're looking for accuracy versus precision, which are uh, questions 51 through 54. So in the book, if you want to see examples of this, this was page 165, problems 51 through 54. Uh, and I'm not going to write these down in detail um, for the sake of time. Uh, but in class, we had something uh, something similar to if uh, if our true weight is something like 50 kilograms, and uh, let's make that a little more interesting. Let's make that 50.5 uh, uh, kilograms. And if we have two scales, scale one uh, weighing, let's say, um, to the nearest half a kilogram, 0.5 kilograms, gives your weight as uh, 50 kilograms. And we have a second scale, scale two, that weighs to the nearest hundredth, let's say, so 0 0.01. And this gives your weight as 51.19. Uh, then in this example, the uh, first scale is more accurate. It is closer to your true weight is only off by 0 0.05 kilograms, whereas the uh, scale two is off by 1.14 kilograms. Uh, but scale two is more precise. It has uh, more detail in its measurement. It's ma it measures to the nearest hundredth of a kilogram. Uh, now, those don't always have to be uh, different measurements. They could both be the same measurement, uh, but that is similar to the question, uh, to the example we had in class. Okay, so that one was eight. Uh, number nine, you want to find the absolute and relative error. Uh, so here your bathroom scale says 145 pounds when you really weigh 138 pounds. Uh, the study guide says relative, but let's find both. Let's find both the absolute error and the relative error. Okay, so question nine. So we have our true weight or the true value of our weight is 138 pounds. And we have the scale gives us 145 pounds. We want to find the relative and absolute error. All right, so let's find the absolute error first. I'm going to abbreviate that. The absolute error is going to be equal to the true value. Uh, no, that's not right. I want to, uh, 
I'm pretty sure it's the measured value minus the true value. All right, so this is uh, 145 minus 138. So we have 145 minus 138. What we get is seven pounds. The absolute error is seven pounds. Uh, that is positive because the scale is weighing us as more than what we weigh. If it was weighing us as less, then it should be negative. In this case, because it is measuring us more than what we weigh, it should be positive. All right, the relative error is equal to the measured value minus the true value divided by the true value. And then this is, remember the relative, whenever we have, see that word relative, we're, we're talking about a percent. So that is, uh, we want that in percent form times 100. Uh, so we would get the 145 minus the 38 is seven over the true value is 138. This times 100 to get us in 2% form. So let's see what we get, seven divided by 138 and times 100. Let's round to two decimal places. So here we get 5.07%. So the error, the relative error is 5.07%. Again, that's positive because that is weighing us as more than what we actually weigh. Okay. So that is question nine. Back to our review. Question 10. You have $10,000 in the savings account that pays 2% APR compounded monthly. Find the balance in the account after five years. Okay. So with, the, with that, the compounded monthly, that is our middle equation here. So let's write that down first since we know we are looking at compound interest. This one is question 10. So we have, uh, let me use the same variables that we had. The amount is equal to the principal times one plus APR over N to the power of N times Y. Okay. And then we want to get the pertinent information. The principal amount, P, is how much we are investing or saving. In this case, that is $10,000. The APR is 2%. And again, we want that in decimal form, so that's 0 0.02. This is compounded monthly. So N, N is the number of times it is compounded per year. If it is compounded monthly, then N is 12. And Y, the number of years we are investing is five years. So we have the amount is going to be 10,000 times one plus our APR is 0 0.02 divided by N is 12 to the power of 12 times five, plug that into our calculator. One plus the point zero 0.02 divided by 12 to the power parentheses 12 times five parentheses. So we should get 11,000 and $50.79. Again, we'll round to the nearest cent, so two decimal places. Oops. Okay, 
So there's question 10. All right, any questions so far? How are you guys, how are you guys feeling? Are you guys still with me? We did 11. We did 12. So around 13 next. And I'm not seeing anything in chat. So it assumes there are no questions. Unless I hear questions or see questions. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at 13. All right. So question 13. So we're looking at results from a class. So we have 1,000 students. We have a median for this exam was 87%. We have the mean for this exam was 92%. We have the low score was 24%, and the high score was 98%. Okay. So let's look at what we have going on here. So let's start with the low score was 24. So here is the low score. Is that 24? The high score was 98. So all of our values. So this is the range of our of our data set. It's all of our values are between 24 and 98. The mean, uh, let's look at the median first. The median was 87. 87. So here's the median. Was that 87? The mean here is at 92. So that is our mean. Okay. So this is what our distribution looks like uh, for the most part. So it looks like most of our data points, most of our data points are here on the right hand side. Since our median, remember the median is the middle point of all of our data points. So half of our data points are greater than 87 and half are less than 87. All right, so first is this symmetric, right skewed or left skewed? Well, it's not symmetric. Uh, if it was symmetric, then the median would be exactly halfway between the low score and the high score and also, if it was symmetric, the median and the mean would be the same value. That is, uh, both of those are not the case, so this is not symmetric. So is this right skewed or left skewed? Well, where are our uh, outliers? Good, our outliers are on the left, so this is left skewed. That is correct. Okay. And is the variation high or low? So for the variation, you want to check
you want to check the mean compared with the median. The mean is a 92, the median was an 87. Since the mean is higher than the median, and I would say this should have low variation. Most of most of the values, in order for the mean to be 92, most of the values are going to have to be relatively high. And remember that our, for our distribution, for our, our distribution, most of our data points are between 87 and 98. So the amount of variation in the scores is going to be relatively low. Uh, yes, so the, the variation is talking about how spread out the data points are. In order to get a in order to get a mean of ninety two, most of the data points have to be relatively high. Have to be really close to. Well, that's not necessarily true, because the median is eighty seven and the mean is at ninety two. So half of our data points are between eighty seven and ninety eight, but our mean is at ninety two. That's taking all of the data points into account. That means that the, the majority of our data points have to be relatively high. Otherwise, our mean could not be 92. It would have to be lower. If, if, uh, if a larger, larger amount of the data points were on the low end, the mean would be lower, right? Because the mean, we're adding all of the, all of the data points together and then dividing by uh, 1,000 since we have 1,000 data points. So most of our scores, where's my mouse here? Most of our scores are focused in this area then. Otherwise our mean could not be 92. And so there, there can't be very many points here, which means that because most of our points are here, this is, it's not spread out, it's pretty concentrated. So it's gonna have low variation. So if the mean if the mean was lower if the mean was closer to the halfway point between 24 and 98 then it would have high variation it would be more spread out but because the mean is the mean is 92 it's it's uh not anywhere near the halfway point between 24 and 98 most of the points are are centered around the the higher values of the grade so it has to have a low variation because most of the points are clustered at at the high end of the of the grade here so any questions on on that on 13 Hopefully that makes sense. I'm keeping my eye on chat again, because I know there is some uh, delay. OK, all right. You're welcome. Uh, so let's go to 14 next. Uh, so 14. Again, this is a hypothetical situation. You are a teacher and you heard from a student that your Tuesday, Thursday class had gotten a sneak copy of the test you gave to your Monday, Wednesday class. You wanna look at the box plots of the data below to verify whether this might be true or not. So looking at the box plots, remember, um, first let's remind ourselves what the box plots mean. I'll use the second one here because that's a little, a little easier to see. 
between the left endpoint and the left side of the box is one fourth of our data point. Between the left side of the box and the middle of the box is one fourth of our data point. Between the middle of the box and the right side of the box is a fourth of our data point. And between the right side of the box and the right uh, endpoint is one fourth of our data point. So this, so the box plot uh, splits our data into fourths. Okay. Uh, now, for this one, the way that this is set up, these should actually be labeled. Uh, the Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday should be right next to the box plot. But that's I'll have to fix that for the exam. Um, this top one is the Tuesday, Thursday class. And this bottom one is the Monday, Wednesday class. So looking at, at how these compare, how these line up, notice that half of the data points for the, for the Monday, Wednesday class, the bottom uh, box plot here, half of the data points look like they're around uh, 78 or higher. That's half of the data points. Whereas looking at the top one, the Tuesday, Thursday class, it looks like the halfway point is almost lined up with the lower quartile. Looks like they're almost the same. So we'll, we'll assume if they're, if they're the same, then 3 fourths of the data points for the Tuesday, Thursday class are 78 or higher. So only 1 half from the Monday, Wednesday class are higher than 78, whereas 3 fourths from the Tuesday, Thursday class are, are higher than 78. So taking this into account, remember that these are the scores, um, could this be true that the Tuesday, Thursday class might have, uh, might have received a sneak copy of the exam? True or false? Seeing a few answers, I'm seeing a couple saying true, a couple saying false. In this case, I would say that this is true, that this is uh, this is a likely possibility. The reason for that is if, if they had not, um, you, would expect, you would expect the box plots to be relatively similar. You would, you would expect them to, to uh, have similar trends. It, is, it seems very unlikely that 3 fourths of the data and, and one fourth of the data it looks like one fourth of the data for the Tuesday Thursday is between uh, ninety what is that ninety seven and one hundred one fourth of the scores are between ninety seven and one hundred and three fourths of the scores are greater than seventy eight for the Tuesday Thursday whereas for the Monday Wednesday okay yeah yeah um, so it seems likely that the Tuesday Thursday class had gotten a sneak copy. Um, now that's not to say that that is that is not proof that they did. That's just evidence that that could have could have possibly occurred. Okay. Uh, Fifteen. Fifteen. Uh, finding standard deviation. We're not doing that, so you can skip that. Sixteen is looking at. Okay, so sixteen is normal distribution. So we have a set of infant weights is normally distributed. So that means it's, it has a normal distribution with a mean of five, that should say pounds, and a standard deviation of one pound. We want to use the 68, 95, 99.7 rule to find the percentage of infants that weigh more than six pounds. And also, what is the standard score if they weigh seven pounds? OK, so that one is 16. Let's go to our digital paper here. Okay, so this one is 16. So we have a normal distribution of weights. 
we have the mean is what is the mean? Where where are we at here? Five pounds. And we have the standard deviation is one pound. Okay. So first, let's do the uh, 68, 95, 99.7 rule. So that tells us that 68% of the uh, weights are within one standard deviation of the mean. So that is our between, we take the mean, which is five pounds, we subtract one standard deviation, so one times one, and we take the mean, which is five, and we add one standard deviation. And so we get five minus one is four pounds, and five plus one is six pounds. So we get 68% of the weights are between four and six pounds. 95% uh, of the weights are within two standard deviations. So we add, we add and subtract two standard deviations. Uh, weights are between, so we take the mean five, we subtract two standard deviations, so two times one. And we take the mean five plus two standard deviations, two times one. So we get that 95% of the weights are between three pounds and seven pounds. And then the 99.7%, we add and subtract three standard deviations. So we'll have five plus three times one, and five, uh, that should be minus, sorry, minus three times one. So we get between two pounds and eight pounds. Okay, so that's using our uh, 68, 99.7 rule. Um, that I could potentially put on the exam. Uh, the next part, find the percentage of infants that weigh more than six pounds. Well, you'll notice here, we have our six pounds. So if we were to uh, draw this normal distribution, this bell curve. Here would be four pounds, here would be six pounds, and this would represent 68% of the data. So notice that outside of that, less than four and greater than six is the 100 minus 68. So we have 100 minus 68, 32% is outside of that. And this is symmetric, which means that half of 32, where is my math? Here we are. So 32, half of 32% is here, and half of the 32% is here. So we can say, that 32 divided by two, that is uh, 16, I believe. 16% weigh less than four pounds. Is that what we wanted, less than four pounds or was it, oh, it was more than six, sorry. Weigh more. than six pounds. Okay. And then we want the standard score or z-score. We want, uh, what is the standard score? For seven pounds. Okay. So for the standard score or the z-score, we take the data value minus the mean 
divided by the standard deviation. So in this case, this, the uh, data value is seven. The mean was five pounds. Yep, minus five divided by the standard deviation is one pound. So in this case, we get seven minus uh, five is two divided by one is two. So two is the z-score, which means that this is two standard deviations above the mean, which is actually what we had. So that was the Z score. Uh, 17 we did. And 19 we did. So the ones that we have left are 18 and 20. Uh, but 18 is a linear equation uh, problem. And 20 is an exponential equation problem where this one is not, it's not doubling time or half life gives you 10%. Uh, so that is the third type of equation we had for the exponential models. Uh, but we've, we've run out of time. So I want to end here. Um, I am going to send out an email tonight to remind you about the final exam. Um, let's go quickly, let's go to our web campus. Uh, so we're still sticking with the final exam schedule. Uh, so let's go to our our syllabus here. Um, am I sharing Web Campus? I think I am. Uh, yes, so, uh, that is that is a good question. There will be a practice test on Pearson that is that I posted. I made available this morning, so that should be accessible uh, right now. Um, so that was that was made accessible this morning, um, and I am sharing. Okay, good. So let's scroll down to the second page. Second page on the syllabus. So our final exam is Tuesday, December eighth. Um, because of time zones, I'm going to have it just available on the eighth. So it won't necessarily be one p.m. because I know that sometimes people have internet issues, or you might be in a different time zone. Just make sure that you do it on the 8th, so it will be uh, two hours. We're going to use Web Campus this time because Pearson had some issues that I, I don't, want to, <laughs> don't want to have a repeat of that. Um, so we'll use Web Campus. Uh, it will be available on December 8th. Once you finish the final exam, uh, send me any uh, scratch paper, any of your scratch work for the problems that you missed. And again, just like in test three, write down the problem, write down all of your work, just as if you were taking the test in person on your scratch paper. And then for any of the problems that you missed, send me the scratch paper. Um, all right. Uh, any last minute questions then before I let you guys go? Uh, clarify theme three. Um, oh, you mean the project. OK, sorry. <laughs> um, OK, for the project, let's go to the project. Um, uh, let's see, project for theme three. Um, I think let's well let's let's look at let's look at um, what is here as soon as this loads. So we go to page two. Number one, each group member should complete the survey that was done. Uh, number two, pick two numerical grade elements. So you're going to pick two numerical grade elements. The two examples here are test one and homework average. Uh, so you're going to need a histogram for those. So you should have two histograms for problem two. So uh, so far we're up to two histograms. Um, 
and you're going to analyze the data and also you're going to run the statistical analysis you're going to look at what is the mean what is the median what is the mode um, the quartiles i do want a box plot you don't you don't need let's see i don't think i have in here a scatter plot anyway so i don't think yeah no scatter plot uh, so you don't need a scatter plot. If you want to include one, I'm not going to dock you points for that, but you don't, don't need a scatter plot. Um, for number three, you're going to decide on a burning question for the data. So the example given here is uh, whether girls outperform boys on a particular item. So let's say for test one. Um, and so you're going to have two more histograms for that. Or no, I think you can do that in one histogram. I think you, I think. I think StatCrunch does that in one histogram. So we're up to three histograms now. And you still want to run the uh, statistical analysis. So you still want to know for the mean, the median, and the mode, and the box plots for, for those. Um, I know that is a, that is a really rough summary. Um, I did post a video. So let's go back to the main page here. I made a video last semester. Um, on project three, and I posted that. That should be, uh, let me scroll down. OK, so there are two pages here under project three module. Uh, that should be under the theme three project. Yes, so this video was from last semester. This goes in a lot more detail. And I uh, go through those examples given in, in the uh, questions uh, two and three, um, how to find those on StackCrunch. So it's not. Uh, it's not the full thing, but it shows you how to get those histograms uh, from StatCrunch, um, as well as the box plots uh, and that statistical analysis. Uh, so that's the, that's the video there. Um, and if you have any any further questions, uh, then I can you can always send those uh, through email. So again, I know that was a I would know that was a really rough summary. Uh -huh. But the, this this video goes through a lot more detail in what I expect and, and how to how to get StatCrunch um, to give you those those uh, not only the the um, histograms but also the statistical analysis. Uh, any other questions? Let me just double check. That was that was under the project three module, wasn't it? Let's let me double check that. Yeah, project three module. That was on a theme three project page. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Let me go ahead and click on that. Okay, uh, so we'll go ahead and stop there. Um, so, so this is our last class, our last lecture. Next, uh, next week is finals week. Um, so your final exam is on the eighth, and I am going to send out an email with that information. It will be on Web Campus. Uh, you will have two hours to complete the final exam, and uh, just remember to to keep uh, write down your, your work on a piece of scratch paper, just as if you were doing it in person. And then once you are finished, send me uh, the scratch paper for any of the problems that you missed. Um, all right. Uh, thank you again for your patience. Thank you for your participation um, and everything. If you need any help, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, otherwise, have a wonderful day and uh, a wonderful end of the semester. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah.